I was going to ask Jamie about the methods the gang members use to kill people in prison. I brought some things along with me here today. We've got a sock, padlock. What kind of damage could a, a gang member do with this? Well, the the sock, the, the lock in the sock was, you know, generally this would be something where if you hit a person in the head, uh, you can do, you know, cause uh, the uh, fractures. You can get some uh, major bumps and stuff. Uh, but if you hit a person hard enough and no, multiple times enough, it could actually cause their death. Can you demonstrate in the temple? Yeah, you 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 want my, to, my temple. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying, you know, so they, you know, you, you go and you you'd be hitting alongside here. But the other thing that people don't realize is they'd want to hit here because it'd blacken a man's eyes shut if nothing else. Yeah, you know, you hit there, you break his nose right at the at the ridge line, the brow ridge line, or you'd catch him up in the back of the head. Which oftentimes that would be good if your guy was already walking down a set of stairs, because now the rest of the stairs are going to take care of the rest of the tumble and, and knocks and bumps and bruises. Then, but generally, uh, a lock in the sock, or in in some cases, if the guy didn't have padlocks, because not all prisons allowed you to have padlocks, they would use state bars of soap, and this is roughly what a state bar of soap would look like. But they'd put about on average three to five of these in a sock actually, and they would beat somebody till this became powdered soap. <laughs> wow. it, you know, and then of course, as it, as it powders up, it'll come out through the sock material. And of course, if it's if you're hitting him in the face, it's going to cause him not to be able to see. And um, again, you know, this would not necessarily do quite as much damage as a lock would, mm -hmm. but it would definitely get a point across to people. And in, in some of the riot situations, some of the prisons that where they had little riots and stuff, I observed more than a few times those that had no other weapon would make these up. And if you get hit with five or six guys swinging these at the same time, you know, two of them can, is that. And, and the thing is also, you got to remember if you hit, use that and you have a lock or sock and you hit somebody like in the elbow or in the wrist, you know, it's, it's going to cause to where that may not function quite as well. Now, one of the things we had there in California when I first went in is that a lot of the prisons, sold us canned goods. So we used to have this uh, 16 ounce can of stag chili and that's a pound. And people would put two of those in a double sock and hit somebody. You hitting somebody with two pounds and stuff. And I've watched eye sockets be shattered, whole grills be taken out, you know? Uh, and the thing is, is that some of the guys even would go to the point where they would, they would take the can and they would rub it on the ground to give it a little bit of a sharper edge that even though it was inside a sock, if it hit you just right on the cheekbone, it would slice open your cheek. You know, uh, you know they, they'd hit you in the head multiple times and, and make you unconscious. And then they can pretty much do what they want. You touched you know? on a few things. Uh, yeah. The eyeball coming out and James Y.T. Bulger. Right. Yeah. So... He just recently was killed. Yes. And... His eyeball was out. They they know it was a padlock in a sock. They they used to smash this mm -hmm, this guy's right. head in. It looks like they also tried to extract his tongue, well, which is a mafia thing for right. snitches. Right. Um, what's your take on on the the murder of him? Well, here here's the thing about that. He's 89 years old, and it took three assailants to attack him. And he was in a wheelchair. Yeah, but the whole point is that. He's 89 years old. I don't care if you were King Kong. You're 89 years old and in a wheelchair. How much honor, how much respect can you get if it takes three of you to do it? Were you that afraid of him at that time? You know, and that's part of the problem that I saw in prisons was that at least in the very beginning when I went in prison, a lot of times it was going to be a one-on-one -on -one fight. And they were more testing your mettle. They were more trying to show you why you should be a part of them and stuff. As time went on, and particularly when you got people like the skinheads and Nazi lowriders and these other little groups coming up, their thing came out to, we have to come in numbers because if we, that there's no honor in losing. So their thing was, <laughs> if you were 89 and they had to send 20 guys against you, if they beat you down, 
hey, we did it. We we won. And now they suddenly thought that was honorable. Yeah. And so that's been that's kind of one of those things that I had problems with. From the perspective of the family members of the, of his victims, though, they were celebrating that he died because he'd kill people by baseball bat, running them over, uh, shooting them in the head, all kinds of things. Well, Jack Nicholson was the part that Jack Nicholson played in The Departed was based basically on on Y.E. Bulger. Yeah, and Black Mass. And, yeah, and Black Mass. There, I Johnny mean, there was Depp. A, yeah, I mean, so the thing was, no, he wasn't a nice man. I'll give you credit, he wasn't a nice man. But here's funny thing. He worked both sides of the street. You know, he worked the gangs when that worked for him. He worked the FBI when that worked for him. And his brother was a senator, wasn't he? Or yeah. a politician. Yeah, he was a politician man. and yeah. stuff. But of course, you got to remember, you know, basically out of Boston, they would tell you if, if, if you're uh, New York and Boston, they would basically tell you if you're Irish, you are going to have to have one of the four P jobs. Work the ports, be a police, be a politician, you know, or be in prison. <laughs> you know, <they> said, <laughs> basically, that's all the Irish had coming. So, <laughs> so you know, and that's the thing is that in the beginning, was he a straight up, you know, gangster that, that was going to the code of that? Probably. But there was a point in time when a lot of the guys that are involved in gangs, a lot of the guys that are involved in these different groups get tired and then they want to leave. And unfortunately, most of those groups have it the blood in, blood out type thing. So you just can't retire. I mean, even people in the mafia were known that they couldn't just couldn't just uh, up and retire, you know. Sometimes they were retired in a nice way. Sometimes they were retired in a not so nice way. But that's the thing. And um, so Whitey, he was a crime boss for an Ital um, for Irish, Irish crime family. Yeah. So he couldn't be considered Italian mafia. No. But the people he was snitching out, because he was working with the FBI for like almost two decades, some of those were mafia figures. He was snitching out the competition. Exactly. So on that basis, do you think? This was a gang sanction hit. This was a mafia sanction hit with the tongue coming out. Snitch. Uh... Quite honestly, what I what I feel, and this is just my gut feeling, is that these were three guys who wanted to try to show that they were somebody so they might gain some respect by the mafia. Look, we killed this guy for you. You know? Yeah. So I think it was more that than, than an actual hit. He'd only been there one day. And nobody actually knew he was going to show up at that prison directly. There may, you know, there's always that this words gets out and blah, blah, blah. But in a direct way, you know, there's not that uh, people knew. So when he showed up, the word got on the line that day and he was killed that day. And so, and like I said, and because these guys were using mafia type tactics, they were trying to show this, this kind of a, a you know, leaning type thing. But because they did it so sloppily, because one of them was his celly, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, you know, I think that would really be something that somebody would have to look into to see whether or not they actually were, or they were wannabes, or they maybe they were associated because they were Italian. But as most people tell you, not all Italians are, are mafia, not all Irish are IRA, you know, that type of thing. Do you feel that the Federal Bureau of Prisons gave him a death sentence by moving him to where he was accessible in the hope that everything he knew about the FBI and everything, he, all this knowledge he had would, would be, would end. He, he couldn't use it against Most the Most certainly. Most certainly. And the thing was that I have learned in the last few years that uh, the U.S. federal government will do whatever it takes to protect their own at whatever level, even if the things that they did were decades old. They'll still try to figure out how to cover up Barrier. and protect their own. Yeah. So we talked about methods of killing people using a lock in a sock, um, cans in a sock, soaps as weapons, but far more effective are shanks. Where right. I was housed, some of the old timers told me I did a whole blog series on it, on all the different uh, types of ways to make different shanks, like the Arkansas toothpick and all these other shanks. Were you housed in California? Were there specific types of shanks and ways of making them? Well, there there were, and it and it kind of depended on what prison you were at. Okay, when I was at the level four uh, Folsom, we had the license plate factory. It's where all the license plate for the state of California are made. Okay, 
So there is metal. So the thing was that getting metal down off the hill was as simple as walking over to a fence and throwing metal down to the lower yard into the bushes. And then one of the guys would be go out there and pick up trash, could pick it up and bring it down. And so uh, the knives that I first saw, the shanks, the shivs, you know, that I first saw were usually referred to as bone crushers. They were generally somewhere between 10 and 16 inches long. They were sharpened to both sides and they would run, be ran into you long, hard and deep when the opportunity were given. Now there were some smaller ones that were used. Oftentimes these were guys that they felt the need for one. They might not have the exact thing, but the funny enough is the very first cell I went to in Folsom, uh, this guy comes by who had moved out and says, Hey, can I have the uh, toilet paper uh, roll uh, holder? He had a little wooden one that was sitting in the whole thing. And of course I'm brand new. I don't know. I said, yeah, sure. So I hand it to him. He takes it out. It's just a round dowel of wood as far as I see. And suddenly he turns it, pulls it out. And there's about a three and a half inch wire tip inside it. That, and he goes, thanks. And he walks away with it. And I went, yeah, okay. You know, so it was right there. Um, but when I got moved from the orientation thing to my first actual cell uh, in, in, uh, in Folsom, my next door neighbor who happened to be at the, uh, he was Portuguese and he was foreign national Portuguese. Then he kind of heard about my, my speaking Gaelic and stuff. And so he had this thing about that. Well, you know, the Celts were in, in Portugal, you know, cause that's why it's called port of Gauls because of the Gauls. And so, so we had this little, we, so we carry that. but he goes, Hey, he goes, uh, you're probably going to need this. And he hands me over three phone books yellow page phone books. The first one was in LA. I think the second one was San Bernardino. And the third was like San Francisco or San Jose. And then a roll of duct tape and said, make yourself a vest. Because when we go out to the yard, we wore these big, heavy, uh, like Navy pea coat, wool pea coats. And because he did get cold at Folsom. And uh, he goes, you want to have a vest under you because even if it doesn't stop the knife, it makes it to where you can't go in quite as far to do your real serious damage. So, <laughs> and, and, and so that was kind of a little bit of an eye opener there. But, but as I, uh, you know, the thing is also, I pointed out that uh, <laughs> I go in to get my clothes at, at Folsom when I first get there, my reception, and they issued you all your clothes and they stamped your number in them. And they would tell you every next year, you get another brand new issue. You know, so you had to wash your own clothes and all stuff. We didn't really have laundry like they do. And nowadays in the prisons, um, but they, besides our, our blue pants and our brown boots and our blue shirts and our white, you know, boxers and your know, white t-shirts. They gave us, they, they gave us two blue bandanas and two red bandanas. And I asked the guard, well, why are you giving them different colors? He goes, depends on whose side you want to be on that day. Right. Really snarky. And then the guy puts up a box of matches, puts me up a couple of packs of, of tobacco, rolling tobacco of that state issued, which is just like powdered dust. Um, gives me a pack of double-edged razor blades and a little hand screwed together uh, razor. And I'm thinking I'm in a prison and you've given me stuff to light things on fire and to cut things up with. What seems to be wrong with this picture? All right. And then of course I get to the cell and I get the first canteen list there and I'm allowed to buy, you know, um, you know, lighter fluid and Zippo lighters and lighter flints. And uh, one of the things people used to make there were match bombs. They take a couple of hundred heads of matches, put it inside some aluminum foil they confiscated from somewhere, you know, snatched off something, make a fuse, and they'd light it and they'd throw it in somebody's cell. Now, it might not do a lot of damage, but it could. But other things people would do is walk by, have a razor blade, slice on somebody if they were sleeping too close to the bars. So the rule of thumb was, if you lived in one of the wings that had barred windows or barred cells, sleep with your head away from the door, which meant you had to sleep with your head next to the toilet. You know, but better to be pissed on than, than have lighter fluid thrown on your face. In Arizona, they had this guy called Bonsai. He was considered the most dangerous prisoner ever. He ended up with the, the, the warden welded him into a cell until they took him out for the death penalty. And he would make milk carton bombs uh, prior to the welding of the door. So what passing a cell, he's got the like the, the cleaning chemicals, the her chemicals, whatever. 
throw it on his neighbor, throw the toilet paper on, set fire. And guys were just burned to death. And the prisoners would almost die just from the smoke inhalation from these guys burning to death. Oh, yeah. There, there, were, that, there were a number of situations like that. Now, another thing that the guys would do is they'd get the rubber examination gloves, the latex ones. And then they would make sure that they ate lots of stuff that was gassy and they'd make their own methane bombs. And they would push that into somebody's cell when they were sleeping and have a, 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 a tether with a, a basically a fuse on it. And if you're sleeping and this thing lands up on your chest and it suddenly explodes, it explodes with this nice little fire, you know, yeah, you're going to get a major burn, you know, and, you know, and, and, and it may sound funny to people who never experienced these things, but these were quite deadly and, and, and quite possible things to happen. So it was something where having a ability to have a bit of a heightened awareness, you know, uh, I've argued with a lot of psychs about the fact that I had psychs from time to time tell me I was paranoid. And I told him, no, I said, because par paranoia, the definition is that you have an unreasonable risk of, of a belief that somebody or something is out to get you. That's an unreasonable belief in that. And I said, but I have proof that people have been out to get me. So if I know people have been out to get me and it's a, an actual fact, then isn't that more called heightened awareness? And so there's been that argument that I've had to go back and forth. Now, getting back to the shanks, um, funny enough, there were a few places I worked. We, uh, I, I was invoked janitorial for a while and I'd help because we'd be cleaning up an area and we'd find a shank that had been left behind 20, 30, 40 years ago that had rusted to behind a pipe or, or something like what that. And, uh, but the best one was we had a change of wardens. And these warden, this warden came down and said, absolutely, positively, there will be no metal coming off, you know, Industry Hill. And uh, he then said, I challenge the Aryan Brotherhood to prove me wrong. Right. And the thing was that most of the lead people at that time in most of the industry shops were AB or AB associates or affiliates. Three days later. On the, the 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 lower yard, the yard where we went out for our recreation and stuff, sitting against the sergeant's shack on the yard was this huge cloverleaf axe that had been made definitely on the hill. It had been welded, been machined. Big cloverleaf axe sitting there up against the door <laughs> and had a little note tagged on it going, say what? <laughs> and <laughs> the warden was so absolutely enraged that he slammed everybody down and went through and he took everything down to just regular pencils and pens. <laughs> and the, of course the joke was you're worried now about this. They can get, you secured it. You had it where they had to go through five different searches coming off the hill. Absolutely. Nobody's going to get this down off the hill. And, and instead of a 12 inch shank, you now have a four foot battle ax with three sharpened <laughs> cloverleaf blades on it. I mean, so who really runs your prison type thing, you know? Now, because of where it was, and <clears throat> because of the fact that it got down during the night, everybody knows that COs were involved in getting it down. But that was one of the things I noticed when I got there. Is interesting enough, Hispanic COs could not depend necessarily on white COs to back them up. Black COs definitely could not concern be so black COs oftentimes align themselves with certain black members of the black gorilla family. Hispanic ones often align themselves we all with the Mexican you know, clubs uh, groups. And so you had these little different things. And then you had some COs that kind of hung out with the around the biker guys, you know. So there was like these little different factions. And when I first got to Folsom, there were only a couple, two, three female correctional officers and they really had it hard every male correctional officer were hitting on them and just about every male inmate was hitting on them and i mean they it, it made it a really really tough drive for them the men didn't like them there and the male inmates didn't like the fact that these women thought that they had the right to search us you know because the male officers didn't have the right to search female inmates you know so we there was there was there was a lot of this, this going on um 
but you would find that you had officers that more or less tried to tow the law-abiding line, you know? And not work with the gangs. And not work with the gangs. But even they felt at times they had to kind of turn a blind eye to certain things. They may not condone it. They may not assist in it, you know? But there were times like if somebody went to go back to the back showers down Blood Alley, which was given that name, not because of the color of the walls, but because of the color on the ground a lot. <laughs> uh, the showers on the yard. You got out there and you got naked in front of a bunch of people on the yard. And there were times when there would be guys showering, some guy would walk up to go shower and everybody could suddenly slip out of the shower while the guy was soaping up his face. And suddenly there was no guards in that area. And the tower guard was looking out towards the main yard, not looking back that way. And oops, uh, how the hell did that guy get stabbed up? Nobody knew, nobody saw. And then, of course, they'd come in, oh, oh, you know, and things like that. So you had these these different situations that would come about, you know. Um, and, and, and again, you know, there were generally, for the most part, people who got stabbed at that time had to have an order put on them to be stabbed. And generally, they had to have done something so severe you know, not paying their drug debts, telling on somebody, testifying against somebody, being a child molester, uh, and and some other different certain offenses. But here's even a thing about sex offenders and 